right, welcome back Pod Squad. Today we have a special guest, it's Dr. McDonald. And uh, we actually first found out about him because he had posted on a podiatry group by the MCAT bros. Um, and it, it was very, very fascinating because he basically shared that he's been in a lot of, I don't wanna give it away everything, but um, he worked on the Olympic team. So that's, <laughs> that's the big highlight, but um, there's a lot that you can do as a podiatrist. And so we wanted to make sure we could hear it from him and see how we also could possibly get to that point as well. Um, so Dr. McDonald, tell us, I guess, first of all, how did you find out about, not how did you find out about podiatry, but what made you want to choose podiatry? Yeah, so thanks for having me on to start off with. Uh, it's, it was a pleasure to talk to you and to your audience. I think it's uh, great that you guys are creating content for people in podiatry and interested in podiatry. So I think I just want to give you guys a quick shout out before I jump into making it all about me. Um, but uh, my background is I grew up in central Illinois. I was a high school runner who had multiple foot and ankle lower extremity injuries. And uh, I saw kind of a Chicagoland podiatrist who had worked with some high level athletes. And his name was uh, John Durkin. Uh, and he'd worked with Olympic champions. And, you know, I'd, I'd thought about doing sports medicine when I got into university, but I wasn't really sure what path I wanted to go down. I had uh, done things like building websites for my team. You know, I got injured some more. And uh, it so happened that, you know, getting into my junior, senior year, I heard about, well, I thought about podiatry could be a reasonable, you know, a good opportunity because um, lots of different things along with sports medicine and running, I feel like I could kind of combine my love for science and biology and kind of combine that with uh, a sports medicine practice maybe. Um, that's, that felt like kind of a, a, the smart move. I definitely enjoyed a lot of things online and the internet was pretty young back in those days. Um, so I didn't, I'd had ideas that maybe I'd do something more in the online world, but I kind of put the blinders on, went to Shoal, and I had a great four years there. I uh, had a great, um, you know, kind of um, in school, but also the rotations and kind of uh, getting to know the profession and kind of the ins and outs. I didn't really know a lot about diabetic foot care and those things before I got into the profession. So it opened my eyes to kind of all the different avenues uh, of podiatry. That's really cool. Thanks for sharing that. I know a lot of people, including Yona, um, have a background in something that has to do with sports injuries or something that made them interested in podiatry in the first place. So that's really cool. Um, and Shoal, I, I know, is a wonderful school. So that's that's very cool to hear. Uh, okay, so now that you you told us how you found podiatry, so then how did you discover that you could do even more than just, like I had said earlier, private practice. So how did you get to do all those other activities? Yeah, sure. So obviously like uh, no two stories are the same, but you know, I matched with a residency out in Portland, Oregon. I went to uh, Legacy Kaiser. So I did a, I think it was a, they call, it had just switched. It's like a PMS 36. So three years there, which was a, a great training environment. Um, the hospitals, you're just part of the the staff there as far as the different rotations you're on you learn so much from the different rotations and um again like you're kind of put the blinders on right you're working 80 hours a week you kind of have a focus where you're with other hospital type residents and my program at least we didn't spend a ton of time out in private practice it was really hospital based um so there was this kind of feeling within our program that you're going to go get a job at a big multi-specialty clinic a big orthopedic clinic or maybe a hospital and that's kind of what I thought it was, what success would be. And I was lucky enough um, when I was done with residency to basically join a large orthopedic surgical clinic. Um, a lot of, that's, you know, I was in Oregon, which is, you know, big for runners and Nike. And uh, one of the guys in the group that I joined actually did one of the first arthroscopic knee surgeries, like close to a competition. The woman who ended up winning the 1984 marathon, uh, the Olympic gold had kind of arthroscopic knee surgery, like five or six weeks before the Olympic trials. And um, so I was in this group with sports medicine and it was going pretty well, but honestly, um, I started kind of getting back into the like online related things. Like I kind of started enjoying um, using some of my doctor money now to fund um, iPhone apps. You have to find ways to market those things. They don't, people just don't show up. This is like right when the iPhone came out. 
Um, and I just was interested in kind of more of those kind of science, um, uh, not so much clinical, I, I enjoy clinical practice and helping people, but I could feel that I wanted to combine those two, those two loves of like technology, medicine, and maybe running in some way that wasn't kind of that nine to five or that clinical practice that required hospital rotations and surgery. I felt like I was well trained to do those things and I did a good job taking care of people, but I just how I was built, like, like kind of that normal path or what most people would see as success, I wasn't necessarily that happy with. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, doctor. I just, so you have a long history and background with uh, Oregon and working with the ortho orthopedic group out there. How did you get involved with an orthopedic group? And was it a dynamic change immediately? Did you have to adjust to certain practices or were you, um, were you well equipped to be in that scenario? And did you, did that open more pot doors for you from there on out? Yeah, sure. I think I was pretty well trained. Um, at, in Portland, we had a lot of uh, interactions with orth orthopedic surgeons and foot and ankle orthopods. So um, at least in the West Coast, in that part of the West Coast, um, you're seen as an equal, obviously, like different people specialize in different areas. And I think that's something that maybe I could glean a little information for the students or for even residents is that, you know, we see ourselves, we are the, the experts of the foot and ankle in way, one way, but that's kind of your, your specialty, but like, that's not really your true niche. And what I mean, like by your true niche is that like, what is it within the profession that brings you happiness or makes you excited? Um, for me, I thought that was gonna be sports medicine. Um, and honestly, like I didn't enjoy being on the kind of injured side uh, of people coming to me. I'm maybe a little more sensitive to those things, but um, and I helped a lot of people, but it's still, you know, you're, you're not seeing people when they're coming to your practice when they're feeling great, right? And maybe, at the, at the last visit, they're feeling great. Um, so it, it takes some resilience. And, um, but I think, like you, like I said, finding that niche as far as what, what gets you out of bed in the morning, what makes you excited, obviously has to be grounded in some financial reality, depending on what kind of practice you're in. Um, but I found my position basically, um, you know, I went through school, went through residency. I gained about 25 pounds. I've always been kind of a skinny runner guy. And uh, I decided at that point in time, I was looking to, not just have a great job, but live somewhere where I could be active. Um, and so I picked out all these kind of different running meccas throughout the US, Eugene, Boulder, um, Flagstaff, Arizona, um, places in California. And it just so happened there was an opportunity. I basically, I basically found those places where I wanted to work and then reached out to all of the different podiatrists and orthopedic groups uh, in those locations. And so it just so happened um, I was in the process of potentially signing with the podiatry group in Grand Junction, Colorado, which is on the western part of the state, which is uh, an interesting area. Um, but right before I was going to sign for them with them, uh, uh, an orthopedic group contacted me that I emailed two or three months earlier and said, we now have an opening, you know, are you interested to interview? And that's ended up where I ended up landing with that, that group in Eugene, Oregon. So. So. Um... So then when you, when you decided to do all of that, when did, when did, I believe you had said you worked for New York times or something, when did that come up sure. in that process? So like, so I'd say that this, you know, going into practice, I started kind of having what I call a very gradual career, uh, career transition. Like I mentioned to you, like I found out that clinical practice wasn't really kind of what brought me a lot of joy. So I had to kind of test things out and see actually what was I going to do, right? I'm not just going to, you know, with six figures of debt with, um, with time and training and people that have helped you from the time you're in undergrad until you're through residency and even in practice, there is some stress. And um, I would, guilt might be a little bit too strong of a word, but you feel like you've spent a long time going down this path and diverting away from that kind of like one path that feels the nat most natural thing um, can bring on stress and um, so I, like I said, I started dabbling in these side projects where I was doing, uh, building iPhone apps, kind of marketing them, um, which required me to kind of learn about social media, learn about marketing skills, learn how to write again. I'd been a writer for my uh, university newspaper, but it'd been a long time since I'd written anything. Um, so that kind of started that, that transition. And honestly, I met my wife who is from, from Montreal, Canada of all places. And uh, she was doing a postdoctoral research fellowship at the University of Oregon. And I'd been in practice about four or five years. I'd done some of these side projects. I developed some skills. 
and she got an offer to be a professor in Montreal. And to be honest, with me, as much as I enjoyed my practice, I enjoyed treating patients, that a move to Montreal kind of made it seem like a, an easier way to kind of break, break free or to kind of test out these skills that I had built up over two or three years of developing a side project. So um, I came you know, to Montreal. Um, it wasn't like a super smooth thing. I found actually the, the, the kind of job listing from the wire cutter, which became part of the New York Times on, a, on, on Twitter of all places. They were looking for someone uh, with a medical background to write for them about uh, shoe inserts and arch supports and GPS watches. And uh, so I did that and combined it with a little bit of some cross country and track coaching here in Canada with that as well as I was still practicing a bit. So I'm trying to mix all of these things. And then uh, so that's kind of where, you know, I started writing more, getting that experience doing that. And then um, that kind of gradually led to kind of a relationship with the, uh, the Canadian Track and Field uh, Federation here in Canada uh, called Athletics Canada. Uh, you just, yeah, you just blew our mind. I, <laughs> I, I just can't believe you went through all of that and somehow made it to that sort of just level as a podiatrist because, you know, we, we sort of feel like there's only like a few routes that we can go through out of residency. And it sounds like you were very proactive with what you do. You use social media as a platform for you to actually engage what is out there in the market and actually put yourself out there with some of your skills or uh, skill set that you had previously in high school, college, and just bring it forth. And it, it sounds like you don't necessarily, you had some medical, you obviously had all the medical background you needed, but you also had a nice skill set to go along with it. So you applied for all these things and it just honestly, honestly catapulted you to a lot of these different opportunities, which sounds like an incredible thing that I think as students, uh, we should hopefully start doing soon or start looking at. Um, and hopefully as residents, we can start doing that. Do you think that social media is definitely the way that we should be moving towards as residents looking for better opportunities in the future for ourselves? What would you say for that? Yeah, I mean, it really depends on the individual, right? Like, I think what I'm excited to talk to you guys tonight, because I see two people that are kind of like doing something that isn't kind of in that traditional kind of like, put your head down, study, just kind of like, and, and that's, I'm, I'm sure you guys do a lot of that. I'm not saying it's not something you guys do. Um, but honestly, I had the blinders on for a very long time. And um, like, I had these inklings that like, I kind of wanted to do something else, or I wanted to kind of like expand. Um, but really, you only do that by kind of like doing real world things. I mean, you can read all about it, and, but until you have kind of like a, a set project or something you kind of want to build, um, maybe it's maybe your people that can learn from maybe some you can learn from other people's mistakes. But, you know, I guess the nice thing about being a podiatrist when I kind of had this epiphany is that I, I had some money to make those mistakes, <laughs> to do those learnings, right? Even though I had debt, I had some income coming in where I could try some different things to level up these skills and then make that transition over a long period of time. This is not something where I woke up the next day and I felt like I snapped my fingers and then all of a sudden, you know, life was great and I was doing exactly what I wanted to do in life. Um, it, there were times when it was extremely frustrating. Um, I, I wouldn't say quite the level of depressing, but um, it's a daily, it's a daily con consistent effort of trying to improve yourself and trying to figure out where do your skills meet with kind of what the market wants or what do people, what like kind of what can you provide to people that's actually beneficial. Um, I think, like you mentioned, social media is one component of it. Um, as far as what I am doing now, like, like I kind of moved, like I said, kind of up the ladder at Athletics Canada to the point where I was the, I was not in podiatry at this point. I was kind of graduated into a, a career more in communications and marketing. So this is where I was doing a lot of writing for them and some marketing. And that's where I became the media attache for the Olympic track and field team um, with Canada. Um, obviously having my background made me much more of a useful team member to some of the medical staff, um, to, to people, you know, I, we went to like a month long training camp in Flagstaff, Arizona at altitude. And um, people would ask me questions about foot and ankle related stuff. And I could give advice, not medical advice. Um, but it gives you a more well-rounded skill set as far as you know about the human body and performance and those things. And it kind of gives you a little different scope of um, what's possible. So 
that was that step. And then, you know, from there, it kind of went to a marketing role at Polar, the heart rate and GPS monitor company. And now where I kind of have my own um, podiatry centric kind of practice marketing company called Podiatry Growth. And, you know, I had friends um, in, from podiatry school and residency that, you know, they heard about social media or they heard about digital marketing, but they have no idea what it is. Um, they're trying to manage their own practice. They're trying to, you know, do their surgeries. They're trying to keep their board certification, do their CMEs, um, have a life outside of practice. And now, now you have to have an online presence. Now you have to like have online appointments. So that's where I, where I'm at now is combining those digital skills with my network of podiatrists to try to give um, back to the people that I went to school with and I went to residency with because there's a lot of agency out, agencies out there that are, you know, they want to have podiatrists spend seven or eight thousand dollars a month on marketing, which um, maybe you have a huge practice. That's a reasonable budget. But if you're a solo practitioner or a group of two or three people, you really want that return on investment of those dollars. And, you know, things like social media or paid search ads, you know, email marketing, having a website that basically shows why you're the go to expert kind of in your niche of podiatry. These things are hugely important. And, you know, obviously the schools are trying to teach you so many different things. They don't necessarily have time to teach all these different digital skills to, um, to kind of put yourself out there um, in a way that positions yourself as the expert in whatever niche you want to go into. Yeah, that's, thanks for also, I mean, you said, you said a lot that we should address, but first of all, thank you for saying, for being honest with us and saying like, this isn't, it's not like a linear, a linear track at all to where you want to get to or where you end up. And, and that's really refreshing to hear because sometimes we think we should know exactly every step we have to take to get to the destination. And we think, yeah, we think we should even know the destination itself. So it's really helpful to know that, you know, you worked your hardest wherever you were at the time and you did the best with what you had. Um, that's helpful. And um, I want to hear a little more about podiatry growth. Uh, that's it's also really cool. So if you could tell us a little more about that, that would be neat. Sure. Yeah. So when I was in, um, when I transitioned from kind of Athletics Canada to the marketing role at Polar, um, you know, you put that update on LinkedIn and uh, some, of, some of your friends or your colleagues that maybe you haven't talked to in a little while, because, you know, I've been kind of out of, I hadn't gone to conferences for maybe five to seven years. And, you know, I still keep in contact with some of my classmates and residency mates, but, you know, it's one of those things where they see that update, and like podiatry growth, you know, like you're not in clinical practice anymore. What, what are you doing? And uh, I kind of explain it to people that, um, you know what, I, as much as I enjoy helping people, I'm kind of more comfortable in front of a, a computer now than I am in front of a patient. So, um, but a lot of, like, like I mentioned to you, like a lot of podiatrists, they're so busy doing other things that, you know, marketing kind of what they want to do, like what they want to show the world that they do. Like, you know, it's, it's I mean, having a website is, is kind of the foundation, right? But the website really has to talk uh, and show people kind of what the type of patients or the type of procedures that you want to do. If you just have a cookie cutter website that has like every diagnosis and every kind of procedure on there and a quick explanation on each page, like that's probably better than nothing. But if you want to be the like running podiatrist, I think there's a guy in Chicago named Michael Chin uh, that has a, a, a clinic called the Running Institute, right? And like when you market yourself or you position yourself like as that person, if you're big enough, if you're in a big enough area, you know, like you just you look totally different than someone that's like the Chicago Foot and Ankle Clinic, for example. Um, so part of what I do now is I basically I work with podiatrists and and kind of small podiatry groups and kind of develop that website, uh, the Google My Business profile. Uh, you know, working on kind of forms of advertising that return. Kind of the money that they give, whether that's the high intent kind of search advertising on Google, which usually does pretty well. Uh, like I mentioned, um, trying to get reviews. Um, uh, patient reviews are really important. Uh, it sounds kind of silly, and maybe it's our kind of our consumer culture in North America. But like when people look at you know a clinic that has a 4.8 and 150 reviews versus a clinic that has six reviews and maybe it's even 5.0 on Google there's like a instinctual reaction people have to those and whether that's fair or not, or 
you know, whether that means you provide great care in the eyes of, of the pe of the people, like, you know, some people are, they look at your website and if it reads like a resume, they don't, they don't care. It's not about them. They want someone that's going to address their problems. Um, so these are the kind of things that I, that I do for the clients I work with is just really reflect back to the public kind of what they want for their clinic and what kind of they want to be the go-to ex experts in. Uh, that's, that's great. I, I hopefully one day I probably will hit you up with Diksha <laughs> uh, if we ever get to that point, because we definitely want to get to that point where we have our own business and, you know, and I think maybe we can do another video where we do talk about digital marketing because that in itself is a whole uh, subject that people I think really need to, need to learn. And I, I know as students, we all day, what we do all day is just sit in front of our desk, study, study for new material in order to impress the attendings, impress the residents and do our very best for the patients. And as that's great. And, but like we do these types of social media things with doctors like yourself, just to understand that there's a whole new world out there. And I, I love how you are just branching out. You just, done, you've done something significantly different from what I, from a traditional podiatrist would have done. Uh, I just have a quick question. So with the podiatry growth, are you seeing patients through telehealth? Are, is it, is it, are you, or do you go to clinic for it? Do you, do you have your own place now? Or how does that work right now? How's your schedule like? I want to know your work-life balance now. Sure. Yeah. So right now I don't do any clinical practice whatsoever. I've hundred percent transitioned into basically my, my business and my livelihood is now helping other clinics and um, building those bonds, those relationships with those providers and then building them out that online presence through all those kind of different channels I mentioned um, and kind of on a monthly retainer people pay me per month to kind of like be that webmaster marketer um, the kind of like their kind of outsourced marketing department in a way wow that's <laughs> that's uh, that's really cool that's I would have never even realized that I don't know. I mean, it makes so much sense too to have someone in our own profession be the one that's leading leading the way, you know, rather than someone who's only maybe had their MBA or something. And I don't know if that would be the person, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying. <laughs> um, no, someone helping with marketing that's not in podiatry. So, yeah. Uh, so then, my last question, unless Yona has more questions, my last question would just be, what what kind of advice do you have for students for future podiatry students or students like us um, about finding our way in podiatry and kind of paving our own path. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of, you know, when you go into school or med school and residency, those require a lot of us, right? And there's all these kind of like mile markers along the way. We get our undergraduate degree and we're like, yay, we celebrate that and we're excited. And then we get into podiatry school and we're like, oh yeah, like, that's the next thing going through school and then get your white coat and just like, you know, it's this one milestone after the other. And that, those are great things. And, um, but those are like sometimes things that are set up by other people for us. Um, and we achieve those things and we see that, you know, we just kind of like, and I was kind of in this mentality, I'm, I'm an achiever, right? Like I want to like, not only for myself, but everyone around me, I want to like, kind of like keep leveling up and kind of getting better. And, those are very tangible things. And um, what I think you have to get used to is that like, maybe what you like to do isn't always that tangible. Like, um, and that's hard because like you, it feels like you're kind of like, I wouldn't say on quicksand, but there's no like, like when you go from a podiatrist and practice to like a digital marketer, right? Like, it's like the wild, wild west way, right? Like, like, are you this like shady snake, snake oil salesman all of a sudden, you know, like that's, Sometimes you, you could think people think of you that way, right? And, um, you know, it, it, so there are people out there that um, are not always the most honest uh, in certain professions. You know, we have board certification. We have all these other things in our profession that help us weed out the people that are not doing right by patients, but there's not that in marketing. So I would say that just knowing what is interesting to you, like what's in your gut, like what is it that brings you joy on, in life and making sure that there's a need for it um, from other people. Um, but don't be afraid to kind of like dabble in like different things you want to try 
like like you guys, for example, this YouTube channel with your doing social media and kind of getting information out there for podiatry students and for people kind of in the pre-podiatry track, like uh, that's very noble because I think, you know, it, there's not these road markers, right? You don't necessarily know when you're going to be a success or like, you know, you know, we're in a smaller profession. So like, you know, if you get 200 views on YouTube, is that successful? Like, but it, it's not really about the views of those things. It's about, you know, staying true to yourself, but also like, I think most people go into podiatry wanting to help other people. And that's what makes me excited about what I do now is that not only am I kind of, my end goal is kind of like helping patients, but now I'm helping my colleagues help patients and see more patients or more of the right patients. So there's lots of different paths, I would say, and just like go with your gut and kind of like what you like to do and like things will work out most likely. <laughs> I can't guarantee it's always gonna work out, um, but you got an, in, like a little voice inside your head, like listen to that voice if you can and kind of nurture some of it. Um, but it's hard though, right? When you're in, in school and residency, you have to be so focused that it's hard, but, um, but nurture that, those interests that you have. And then once you get out of residency and you maybe have a little bit more time, you can continue to nurture those things and not be afraid to make a gradual transition if that's something that people want to do. I think everything you said today was, uh, you, you said a lot of things that I think could become quotes, to be honest with you. They're, they're just so inspirational because I have never had, to, I never talked to a doctor who's actually been so open about what he's doing and how he's doing it and just, just marketing himself out there. And it's just, it's just so nice. It's like a breath of fresh air to know that there's more to podiatry than just going the traditional route, working at like some Kaiser and just working 80 to hundred hours a day or uh, through a week. So it's just, it's so nice because I know that I know there's a lot of students out there who are going to benefit from just watching this video and understanding your mindset and how you went through your route. And it's nice to know that, you know, everyone has their own route, but it's what we make of it throughout this journey, because I know uh, we pay a lot of money. We will go through a lot of debt. But like you said, you were able to invest some of your time, your skill set, and some of your money that you made in order to be a successful person who actually enjoyed doing their passions. So that to me is success in itself. So again, thank you so much, Dr. McDonald, for coming on our channel today and honestly educating our, our audience about this because this is something that we should all listen to and actually take a piece from, uh, from you. Well, I appreciate you guys having me on. Like I said, I think what you guys are doing here is uh, pretty great stuff as well. So uh, congrats to you as well for, uh, for kind of getting this information out there that wouldn't necessarily be out there. Um, so no, it's a, it's, it's a mutual thing. Anyways, thank you so much. And, and Diksha, do you have any last remarks that you want to say? Dr. McDonald, thank you again for all your time and Pod Squad signing out.